Good morning. I didn't know that there was this secret hotspot down in Christchurch. Now I do. It won't be a secret anymore. Because we will tell everyone, if you want to move to Christchurch, there's a church. So, uh, no, it's, it's great, really. Uh, just enjoyed being around you. And uh, as I said, uh, somebody said to me, I bet you say that to everywhere you go. We don't say this everywhere we go. That was the best conference we've been at since we moved back uh, to England three years ago. And we don't say that. Um, Your ability to steward the presence of God, um, the people you've got working together in worship and teaching and 12-year-old drummer that should should be on Britain's Got Talent or something, I don't know. And, uh, you know, secret weapon from Brazil that, my gosh. Like she just stands up and says, well, you know, it's, it's the eighth most dangerous place in the world and the you know, most dangerous city and the most dangerous corner of the city. And it's like, you're crazy, but I get you. I get you. So, yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, just a quick plug. Uh, we, we left the book table out there um, um, from the conference. This is uh, my latest book. I've actually written three books, which kind of feels really weird. It's very funny, my little Fletcher, my seven-year-old grandson I, I was talking to him last Sunday morning and I saw this my my latest book you know and uh and I said well yeah I've written two others and he, he looks at me he goes does that mean you're an author it's like <laughs> that's pretty smart for a seven-year-old actually I'm not sure I knew what an author was when I was seven but um so it it's actually not available yet on Amazon or anywhere else other than here um and uh, we got we got some printed early to bring to this because it just seemed like a Father Heart conference. And when you print a book and realize it's the same color as the wall of the church, <laughs> like you, you know you must be tracking with God, you know? Like, I mean, I mean, who paints their wall? And then you're even wearing that. You were wearing that color on Saturday. Like, I didn't even know that people were wearing that color. But there we go. It looked good on you. Um, and it is a now color. So things fathers do. It's... Uh, it's the way that I am. I teach. I teach from a practical place. I, I love the supernatural, but I also know that, you know, you know, once everything that you see was supernatural because it only existed in the heart of the Father. And we, we have a very limited view. We, we, we limit the natural and the supernatural. Once there was nothing on earth made by man. Seriously. Look at what we've done. It's pretty amazing. Anyway. This is uh, really the, the center of this message is that fathers do things. And ladies, you reveal the father too. It's just that I'm a father and I was writing a book to fathers. And it's awkward to call it fathers and mothers do things. It doesn't kind of flow the same way. But we reveal the father. And uh, there are things that we do like create security, create home, show our kids the world, show our kids how to love their spouses, things that fathers do. And so it contains my journey um, as well um, is a, a chapter in there uh, to the ladies, about 28 short chapters with little action discussion points at the end. And uh, is, there, is there a somebody who's about to become a father? Your wife's pregnant right now in the room there we go it's for you come on come on and you're nearly wearing this color it's close bless you and i just also want to minister to one group of people i, I won't uh, take too long with the story but about 18 months ago uh, a man gave me a word of knowledge and said you have a problem with your shoulder and uh, to be honest I was I wasn't really I, I knew I had a problem with my shoulder but it wasn't like a big big problem with my shoulder I, I put it down that I drove for 15 years a left wheel drive and it was automatic and I moved back to England to drive a right wheel drive and it was a stick or manual and I developed uh, my, some tendonitis recurred. In actual fact, I also developed some uh, uh, um, tendonitis of my Achilles for using a clutch for the first time in 15 years, you know? And because uh, the weird thing about driving in America is that if you, I did have a, a manual for a while. The weird thing is that your clutch foot's the same, but your gear shift's not. 
It's very, there are weird little things that go on in your brain. Anyway, uh, the man came up to me. He said, something wrong with your shoulder. And I said, yeah. And he said, put your arm up. And I could only get it to there. And, uh, and he, he prayed for me. And he also manipulated my shoulder. He happened to be a very uh, skilled uh, physical therapist. And uh, he's also a chiropractic, which I'm a little more nervous of, to be perfectly honest. Um, but um, as soon as he'd done it, I knew that it was coming. He prayed for me, and he, and he did a couple of things. And I laid on the ground, and I'm a sleep with my arms under my pillow. I know you wanted to know that. You needed that information this morning. Uh, and I couldn't lie like that until that moment. And I laid like that perfectly. And uh, I can lift my shoulder there now. Um, and here's the thing. I, I just want to pray. And I know there's one man here, so it's not a word of knowledge. But I, I want to pray for anyone who has got a, a shoulder problem. I'm going to jump up if that's you. Uh, I also want to pray for you if you have arthritis. But I want it specifically this. If it keeps you awake at night. That I've seen breakthrough in this, specific breakthrough in arthritic pain that keeps you awake at night. And, um, and I started praying for arthritis when I prayed for my wife's mum, my mother-in-law, who's a great mother-in-law. There's no mother-in-law jokes needed in my family. She's wonderful. And uh, I prayed for her thumb and the arthritis stopped. She had arthritis beginning. So just uh, turn around, reach out your hands to somebody who's standing. And uh, Father, I just declare right now healing of shoulders, that you would perform creative miracles, that you would restore ligaments, cartilage, that you would even recover joints, that you would literally work creative miracles, tell arthritis and arthritic pain to leave bodies, and those that can't sleep, that tonight your arthritic pain does not wake you up in the night, and you have the best night's sleep that you've had forever, for ages. Jesus, take care of these bodies. Bring complete healing right now to shoulders every joint affected by arthritis and do for them what you did for me complete healing no pain no tendonitis in Jesus name now as they're all joints check them out to see if there's any any change any relief of pain keep your hand up if you've if you've got some breakthrough if you're beginning to feel some breakthrough, wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. Right, we've got some breakthrough over here, so it needs to come over this side. So just pray some more. Just speak out in faith. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What he's done once, he will do again. We'll just pray once more, but you may well get breakthrough as I preach or you might lie on your bed tonight and go oh my word what happened take care of these joints arthritis stop now retreat from bodies in Jesus name just check that out once more just see how you're doing raise your hand if you got some breakthrough all right Okay, give thanks for that. A number of people with breakthrough. Carry on receiving as I preach. And we bless you, Jesus. You are healer. You are healer. You are healer. You may be seated. Carry on receiving as I preach. Sometimes my my mother-in-law, when I pray for her, I always say, check it out. And she says, it'll be better in a day and a half. That's what she says to me. It's like, why? So it seems the way it works. All right, okay, I won't ask you anymore. I'll just pray for you. Well, I think anyone who's been at the conference realizes by now that I am capable of dumping out large amounts of information when I preach. I'm going to try and behave myself a little bit this morning. But uh, a while ago, I was uh, I was just praying and, and reading, and I. I felt like the Lord said to me, if you read Zechariah 4, I'll give you the keys to a generation. Well, it was a bit scary, really. Um, I've read it a lot. Um, and it's, it's an amazing chapter. Just before uh, at the end of chapter 3, it says, I am going to bring in my servant, the branch. And that coincided with me um, having a song in my head that I couldn't get rid of. And I don't actually ever want to get rid of it, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and the song is Andre Crouch. Anyone remember Andre Crouch? Anyone go to Hammersmith Odeon or anywhere like that? Oh my gosh. He was the man. And he sang a song, Jesus is the answer. For the world today, above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. 
And, uh, and I had that song in my head, uh, and I can't sing. I'm not like these guys that come up here and sing and do announcements and then sing a bit more and stuff like that. I'm not that guy. Uh, you, you can hire me to sing if you want to end meetings. I can do that. So I had this song, Jesus is the Answer, and then I, I've got this going on. Well, here's, you, you probably know that that refers to Jesus, but it's fascinating. I'm going to bring in my servant, the branch, and he's a Nazarene, and Nazareth means the branch. That book is stunning in its detail, the intricacies, and so is your life, because he will plant those same threads and themes uh, and clues in your life. And so we have that. I'm going to send you my servant, the branch, and um, I'll come back to some of chapter 4. But the verse, verse is this. Uh, the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was awakened from his sleep. I, I believe that we are on the edge in this continent of an awakening. I, I believe that we, we are in it and we're seeing it. And, and, and it's like there, there's more to come. But that awakening, I think, um, is, uh, is two aspects. And I just want to talk a little bit about it. Um, I believe that we are being awakened to the needs of the world. And I believe we are being awakened to the power of Jesus Christ. And we need the both. And uh, I'll just put Jesus in the middle there because he really is the answer. And we'll, we'll come back there. I don't know what you think about our world, but I sometimes... Can you see okay over there? Do we need this? Not at all. You can see me. I've just put Jesus in the middle of a square. With my, can somebody just come and... Is there somewhere else we can put it that might be a little bit better? I don't mind going a bit further back. I, I'm a very flexible preacher. I don't care where I am, really. Um, I don't know how many of you have, have sort of reviewed the, what's going on in the world. Our, our world is is... There's a lot going on. I almost feel that we've kind of been asleep. The church feels to me like we've been asleep. Where were we? There's, there's stuff going on in our world. So let's have a look at a few things. Some effects of some things. Let me start with this. Secularism. How many of you even know what I'm talking about with secularism? A few of you. Let's have a look at that. So... Secularism. I, I read a, a definition and I've extended this a little bit because I liked this definition. And the definition that the, the writer said was that secularism is wanting the kingdom without the king. That resonated with me. I, I, can, I can feel that ar- around me. And, uh, you know, we've seen the great advances of the kingdom You know, so much of what we get to experience today, the stuff that I referred to earlier that's been made by man, the developments, the, you know, so much of the Western world. There's a great book that's called The Book That Made Your World. And it's basically saying, take the Bible away from the Western world and we probably wouldn't have got to where we are today. The the develops in in medicine and in science that so many of them are, are about the king and the kingdom. But today we're watching people who want to experience and enjoy the benefits of the kingdom, but don't want a king. I extended that and began to think, oh, it's, it's more than that. It's people want Christianity without Christ. I, I read articles or these, you know, where people decide, oh, you know, I've, I've been a worship leader for 25 years, but I've, you know, I've decided to walk away from the church, you know, and they'll write these long articles and post them on social media, but they'll end with this. Oh, but let's not forget love, joy, hope. It's like, hold on a minute. You want Christianity without the Christ, not an option. It's not an option. It's it's secularism. And I would add to that, I don't know how many of you have noticed this, this desperation to protect creation. And people want creation without a creator. Not an option. Not an option. And the more we study science, I believe the more we are finding out and discovering, rather like you just beautifully sung, there is no black hole. There's a father at the sender. I'm not sure how you said it, but I think you said something like chucking stuff out or something like that. It was beautiful. You can't have creation without a creator. 
Then I'll add the slightly risky one, but who would have ever thought that this would be a risky thing to say? You can't have heaven without a hell. Whatever, however you want to define hell, Jesus taught about it so clearly. So we have a world with secularism. And I, I want to suggest to you that that has created a world where people believe that they can do what they like. We've also got a world which is so dominated by social media. I mean, it's, it's kind of almost crazy now, isn't it, that political campaigns can hinge on social media, can hinge on what you can manage to say in 140 characters. It's a very interesting world we found ourselves in. And, and, you know, without going into too much detail around it, but social media, media has created a world where many think that they can say what they like. And they are saying things that they wouldn't say to your face, although I would suggest that people have become so used to saying what they like on social media that some of the guard is down face to face and people are saying things face to face that 10 years ago they wouldn't have said. So we have a world where people are saying what they like, are doing what they like. We also have, and I'm not going to blame one person for this because I don't think it's one person at all, but we also have a fake news world. We have this sort of uh, influx of conspiracy theories, but it's gone beyond that. We've got people who say the Holocaust didn't happen. How dare they? People who say that, that Sandy Hook, where those 26 children died, that that didn't happen. There's a guy with a radio program pretty much devoted around that kind of stuff. And, and so we found ourselves in a world where people think that they can believe what they like. And then finally, and, and this is an interesting one because it's not all bad, but it's an interesting one. And that is globalization. When I first got introduced to globalization, it wasn't anything like it feels it is now. But globalization has given us a world where people can go where they like. Let me jump back for a moment to Zechariah because um, it's a stunning passage and, and I encourage you to just read Zechariah chapter 4 and realize that some of the gems of our faith are in there, the, some of the, the verses that we know are in there, but we might not know the reference. And, and there's this whole picture of this crazy image and a conversation, um, you know, where, where Zechariah says, you know, what is that? And the angel says, well, you know, don't you know? It's like, no, that's why I asked. I mean, uh, and there's all these bowls and lampstands and weird stuff. And the reply comes, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. I wouldn't have got that from that image in a million years. And that's a, a, that's a phrase that we know. Uh, and then we, we, we go on and, and there's a couple of other pieces. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying this, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. And then miss out a few words don't despise the day of small things that's where it comes from just in case you wondered but these seven which is the eyes of the lord will be glad when the plumb line is in the hand of zerubbabel um i'm pretty sure at the conference there was an architect um don't be offended by my drawing but i want to whoa this is the highest flip chart i've ever worked with actually um i'm just gonna let's move that there there is a description there of a foundation. The foundation has been laid. I don't know whether you realize this, but this continent has the greatest foundation of all the continents on earth. The, the, this continent and a little touch of the Middle East and uh, a little bit of Africa grabbed hold of the gospel and we sent it to the four corners of the earth. We had revival before nations knew their name. We had reformation before nations were birthed. We had a renaissance before paintbrushes were in the hands of other people. We did. Do you not know that? I'm trying to encourage you. This is our continent and we're on the verge of something happening. We have a foundation. We may have lost our way. We may have deviated in some places. But, but we gave the world, the preachers, we, we gave them to the world, the the theologians, the missionaries, the, 
the worship leaders, the songwriters. It was birthed in our continent. I'm not saying it with arrogance and pride. I'm just saying we got a foundation. And, and you know what foundations give? Foundations give boundaries. And I don't know whether you noticed, but what I just put up there was basically a boundaryless world. Do what you like. Say what you like. Go where you like. Believe what you like. And, and I, I believe that what's, what's happening is that our foundation is being, like we're being reminded of our foundation and we're being reminded of the boundaries. And a boundaryless life doesn't work. It does not work. Where there is no, no vision, Proverbs says, the people are unrestrained. I think it means this. Where there is no God-given revelation of truth, the people run around in circles. But happy are they to live within the boundaries that those principles provide. We have a foundation. I, I could go further into this. And then it says, But the eyes of the Lord will be happy when the plumb line is back in the hand of Zerubbabel. What is a plumb line? A plumb line is a carrier of the principles of heaven to earth. A plumb line was, only works because of what God put in creation at its birth. Gravity. And, and so what you have is, you, we, we have, as it were, pillars on the four corners of a foundation. And I believe that what this chapter is saying is, let's, let's remind ourselves of our foundation. And let's restore the principles of our faith. Let's put them back in place. And I'll take us to the end of that passage in a minute. You see, I, this is what... I, I might just pull that off. That might work. Okay. All right. Otherwise, I'll ask for the steps or something. But... See... Uh, my observation of our world, and I draw these quadrants all the time, and people say, why do you draw quadrants? I say, well, it, it's the greatest piece of branding that was ever done. Jesus died on a cross, you know. It worked for him. People say, why do you divide your teaching into groups of four? Well, I can do threes, twos, ones, fives, sevens, and eights. But four, well, there's four seasons, four gospels. There's north, south, east, and west. So it seems like there's some principles. So I'll run with it. But, but this is my observation. Four of the challenges that are facing our world and the people in our world today. And, and I, if I had longer, I could do a little bit more connecting um, of them. But just run with me. Our boundaryless world has created some challenges for the people in our world. And, and it's my belief that we need to present the answer to the world. And not just sit back and let it happen and go, well, yeah, you can go where you like, you can do what you like, you can say what you like and be, believe what you like, and it's not going to affect anyone. It is. It's created challenges in our world. So let me, let me identify some of these challenges to you. Um, let's, let's start with this. We have a generation, and when I say generation, I'm not looking at X, Ys, and Zs. I'm looking, we're a generation. You can talk about the generations, the millennials. That's, that's another way of looking at it. But the way I look at generation in this context is, if you're breathing right now, this is our generation. <laughs> this is ours. This is our time on planet Earth. And what we've got is, we've got a generation suffering from choice anxiety. And they're afraid of making a choice. One of the reasons, I think, is because there's so many choices because you can do what you like, say what you like, go where you like, believe what you like. I know you're going to make a song out of those four somewhere. I can almost hear you playing with it, playing with it in your head while I say it. But, but we've got choice anxiety. You know, those of you who are sort of, you know, my age, you know, 30 plus, that kind of age group. Um, when, we, when we left school, university felt like it was about a dozen courses that you could teach in school and a profession, lawyer or doctor. It felt like that. Now, I mean, you can study Michael Jackson's clothing, if you want to, it seems, and get a PhD for it. I mean, the, the number of, of possible 
things that you can study, the, the number of jobs, the number of career choices. You know, I always have to drill down now. I'll say, you know, what are you studying at university? And you have to almost drill down because you know that that subject has been divided a hundred times. And, and the, the choices. So there are people who, who have this thing called choice anxiety. They are afraid of making a choice. And uh, I'm going to come back to it in a minute and, and deal with it and minister. But what you've got is choice anxiety, which has actually created people who are frozen or stuck or paralyzed for fear of making the wrong choice. And, and it's definitely something that is around our world. We've then, we've then got people who have what I would call commitment phobia. It's a fear of commitment. They're kind of related, but they're different. You know, what if, what if I commit myself to that and it turns out not to be right? You know? So, so we've got people who are afraid of making a commitment. I, I think we've seen a little bit of this in the church, to be honest. Um, I think some of even the deconstruction stuff around the church is related to, well, I don't want to commit myself to a church, to an organization. Because, you know, sometimes things go wrong. So what have we got? We've, we've got people who are running from one thing to the next instead of staying still. Now, I, I'm a generation and inside here is a job for life guy. Ironically, I'm on my fourth career. But inside, I think, I, I mean, that's the way I am. I was going to be a nurse for life. I was going to be a prison governor for life. I thought I was in California for life. But he had another plan, so we're back here. And, but actually, the way I work, if I say I came here and served you for a week, this is my church for a week. I'll, I'll own this place. I'm, I have that commitment thing inside of me. But that is not our, our generation's way of living. And there is definitely this running from one thing to the next. We've also got a fun one which some of you, I might even introduce something new to you today, FOMO. How many of you know what I'm talking about? FOMO, fear of missing out. Seriously, now, fear of missing out for me when I was young was, I was sick at my best friend's birthday party, so I missed his birthday party. It wasn't a way of life, but fear of missing out has almost now become a way of life. And of course, you know, hugely... Um, influenced by social media because everyone on social media has a better life than you they have better holiday better house better car they have more fun they have more excitement because nobody does a selfie in the middle of an argument with their wife and say this is what my life looks like today you know so so we got this fear of missing out which I want to suggest to you is leading to a generation that are living a lie. And it's not just a fear of missing out of one event. It's perpetual. And I, I genuinely know people. I look at their social media profile and I go, it's just not true. I know you. That's not true. So we've got this. And don't try and work out who I'm following on that anyway. So, but, so we've got... Choice anxiety, commitment phobia, fear of missing out. We've got people who are stuck, frozen, paralyzed, afraid of making a choice. We've got people who are running from one thing to the next. Uh, we've got people who, with a fear of missing out, are, are living a lie. And, and then uh, what we've got is a, a loss of purpose. And uh, let me just highlight these a little bit in case you can't see them, the distinction. Loss of purpose. This, it's fascinating to me. You know, uh, people at every level of apparent success struggling with, why am I alive? This sense of l loss of, of purpose doesn't make sense. You know, one of the great tragedies for me is when I watch some of the greats, you know, end up killing themselves in a New York apartment block. And people like Heath Ledger, they break, uh, they break my heart. Those kind of scenarios, the the Whitney Houston type of scenarios, and and I mean, if you watch Judy recently, the the I think a great movie, you know, but so sad that somebody that talented, that gifted, uh, and of course that's going back, but it, so it's not totally new, but I think it's become much more prevalent in, in our world. 
And, and so, you know, the loss of purpose, which interestingly, I think the observation is, uh, and, and I think it's something that you're actually picking up on here and already aware of is, but there's, there's people living with sort of a low-grade anxiety um, or that sort of depressive or even um, suicidal thoughts that are going on. And, and that has definitely become a huge part of our world, I would suggest. And, and the conversations about, about mental health uh, and issues around that uh, it, it seem to be much more frequent conversations. Uh, so so this is, this is, there's probably more. Um, some of you might go, oh, what about that, you know? I mean, you know, you can put alongside here, I think it's, it's, uh, it's evil twin is you only live once. FOMO and YOLO, they, they're kind of like, they, they seem like they go together. Sound like they should be in a Star Wars movie, don't they? But, but um, you know, this, this is a picture of, of the world what we find ourselves in. And uh, remember, Jesus is the answer. Yeah? I did begin there, didn't I? Jesus is the answer. How many of you would say that you relate to something that I've written up there in some way in your life? Choice anxiety, commitment phobia, loss of purpose, fear of missing out. How many of you? And I'll multiply it by 10 on the basis of how many people put up their hands to an average question. All right. So let's have a, let's have a look at this. See, what, I, what I'm believing is that what Zachariah is saying is, let's, let's stand on the foundation and let's put the plumb lines back up. Now, I could teach just about the plumb lines. That's not where I feel like I should go this morning. I want to go down a road more of ministering to individual people. But, but I would suggest that if I was to, to go for four plumb lines, which I'll just give you uh, four headlines of this, I would say the plumb lines of relationship need to be put back in place. And, and of course, ultimately, that relationship is the restoration of our relationship with the Father, which then affects every other relationship that we have in life. So I do believe that, that that original relationship, and of course that would spill over into so many areas, and of course a lot of the things going on today, like gender confusion and identity and stuff like that. Um, and it is my belief that, that we will find our way back to the foundation and we will find our way back to the principles. Because the insanity of our world will not last. Because it is so far removed from the principles of heaven that it just won't work. It will, it will end up petering out. But in the meantime, we need to do something about it. I would say the plumb line of truth. Uh, and and we, we need to be willing to stand for truth. And uh, who would have ever believed that some of the things that we would feel that we're, we're going to be criticized or persecuted for are the things that we absolutely took as you know irrefutable truth those of us of my sort of age i mean male and female he created them end of i mean let's just stop the discussion there but where are we on that so the restoration of truth and of course one of the names of the holy spirit is the spirit of truth so i would say relationship truth assignment I would say that our assignment as man on earth and the, the restoration and the rediscovery of our assignment is one of those plumb lines. And, and that we're not here for, for our pleasure, although there is pleasure in our lives, but we're not here for our pleasure. You know, the, the, the Westminster Catechism, you know, the, the chief end of man is to worship God and enjoy him forever. We get the joy, but we get it by starting with worshiping God. So I would put in their assignment, the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is assignment, assignment 101 for mankind. And then um, the, the fourth, I would say, is, is the spirit and his power. And the awareness of the supernatural parrot sauce. That was a little just to, just to let you know that I could draw a chart with four just for the plumb lines. So let's have, let's have a look at these four issues. Let's have a look at choice. Let's have a look at choice anxiety. Why are people afraid of making a choice? I think they're afraid of making a choice because they believe a lie. And that lie is that I can make the wrong choice. 
Because that's a lie. Now, here's the thing. You can make the wrong choice, but he's so good that if you're in relationship with him, he'll take your wrong choice and he'll redeem it. How does he do that all the time? I don't know. Except he's God. All things. All things, the Bible says. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. He didn't say some things. He didn't say when you have 300 prophets that agree with your decision and your choice, it will work for good. He said all things. All things work together for good. So the problem is we believe a lie that we can make the wrong choice. And and so we end up paralyzed and we don't make choices. Or we end up paralyzed because there's so many choices. And, And one of the things I put in my father's book, you know, is that fathers teach children what they love. They give them opportunity to discover what they love. It's one of the great keys for mankind to discover what we love, the part of God's heart that he put inside of us, and to use that to bring glory to his name. And, and so the first one of these is, is that, you know, we've got we've to get rid of this belief that we can make the wrong choice. And I, I always go to uh, Joshua as well when I'm teaching this, where Joshua says, choose you this day who you will serve. And from there, every other choice lines up. See, the two biggest choices of my life are Jesus Christ and Sue. They are. I know it sounds weird putting those there. They're the two biggest choices of my life. No question about it. And every other choice has actually been a result of those two choices. I would not be here today were it not for those two choices. I wouldn't be in this room today if it were not for those two choices. I gave my life to Jesus Christ February the 28th, 1973, and I married Sue on April the 14th, 1979. Yes, I do remember my wedding anniversary. (laughs) And it was my wife that took us to Bethel Church. Which means that it was my wife who opened the door for me to step into this season of my life. I made a choice. A loud yes. This is what I believe. Some of you need to make such a clear loud yes with such confidence and believing all things work together for good to those that love God. And knowing that when you make a loud yes, it starts to create many no's. And, and you, it, it is the absence of a loud yes in a world where you can do what you like, say what you like, go where you like, and believe what you like. It is the absence of a clear yes to something. It's Psalm 27. One thing I ask, that I may seek. One thing. One thing. There's something about the one thing, the focus. If choice anxiety, if you right now feel like you're stuck, you're paralyzed, I want to invite you to stand. What you say? Oh, great, because you're the courageous one. Because, because you're one of those people that breaks the culture in a room and has the courage to be you and be real and say, hey, I need some help. Because <laughs> actually, a whole load more people stood up after you said that. <laughs> Father, I'm asking right now that you would release courage for everyone standing to make a choice. I want to give you this gift. It's my, my interpretation of Romans 8, 28. He wastes nothing. He gets you ready. He wastes nothing. He canceled the assignment of the father of lies to put a lie in your head and in your heart that says you can make the wrong choice. I, I canceled the confusing spirit that's given you too many opportunities and too many ideas. And today wants to say, choose the one thing today. Create a loud yes that creates many no's. Choose you this day who you will serve. And I believe that some of you in a year's time will think back and realize my yes has become clearer every day of this year. I ask for the loudness of the yes to be so clear for everyone standing. Choose you this day whom you will serve paralysis stop being stuck stop in the name of jesus amen
You may be seated. And then, commitment phobia. A fear of making a commitment. Something better might come along. Now, there's actually a truth sometimes in that, but it's not because of your running. It's usually when, when something's removed. My wife has got this from Joel Osteen. It's one of her sort of favorite pictures of Joel Osteen. Is if, if you need some encouragement, go online, listen to a Joel Osteen message. You only need to find one because I guarantee he'll speak to you. We, we used to have a satellite radio in our car in America. I could get in the car, go on a five-minute drive with Joel Osteen and go, how did you know that that's what I was thinking right now? He's just so encouraging. But he, has, he, he says, you know, say you're going after a house and the house falls through. He has this principle. It's because there's going to be a better one. Now, when things are taken away, that's a principle. But, but you know, this, this one is the opposite. It's actually this fear that there's always going to be something better coming along. So you're afraid of making a commitment. And we have raised a generation who are running from one thing to the next. I have sat down with people and they've, I've said, you know, well, what are you going to do next year? It's like, well, I'm just trying to work out what, you know, what school of ministry to go to. And it's like, then I talk to them. It's like, so you've been to Toronto, Bethel, Iris, YWAM. I have a feeling it's about time you made a commitment to something. It's about time you kind of decided. That's why you're so amazing, Katie. You know, you went, went to, you know, well, you got hold of it at 13. You went to university and now you're like, that's what I'm going to do. And it sounded like you were going to do it for the rest of your life. Because I said, when are you next coming back? You said, I'm in Brazil for life. It's like, well, you could pop back for a holiday every now and then. You know, you're, you're, you made a commitment. It's like it, it drips off of you. And people are afraid of making a commitment. Honestly, I think it's affecting people in relationships. I, I do believe that there are people who are afraid of making a commitment, you know, to a one woman, to a one man. What if a better one comes along? It's crazy. Some of you are laughing way too loud, and you've been married a while. <laughs> the Bible says this, commit your ways unto the Lord, and he will direct your path. He will trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not onto your own understanding. Your steps are ordered by the Lord. He, he's looking for people who make a commitment. And the nature of our Christian faith is what? Faith. You didn't join this family because of what you can see. So commit your ways unto the Lord. There's a phrase in Romans, it appears twice, I love it. The obedience of faith. Obedience is tangible. You tell me to sit down, I know to do something. Faith is intangible. He puts the tangible and the intangible. And he says the obedience of faith. If you feel like you've been running from one thing to the next, from one job to the next, from one relationship to the next, from whatever, one idea to the next, one dream to the next, I want to invite you to stand. There's one over there. There we go. He wants to take care of this. Commit your ways unto the Lord. See, I, honestly, I am a job for life guy. I know it seems strange because I joke and say I've had four, I am on my fourth career. I didn't really plan them. But they all began with a moment when I heard God speak to me and call me to ministry. Not a phrase I like to use today because I believe we're all in ministry. But as a result of that, I wrote to Sue's grandfather. He said, go and get some experience working with people. And nursing took me to prison. And prison officer, not in locked up, working in prison... <laughs> Being a prison officer took me to being a prison governor. And then my wife takes me to Bethel and my prison experience and strategy and organizational leadership brings me onto a team. And and so it's one continuous journey for me that began with a commitment. So Father, I'm asking right now that you would release that this sense of commitment. this, This awareness that if I commit my ways unto the Lord, you will. You will faithfully guide my life. 
Father, I pray right now, cancel anything that's running, anything that's going from one to the next. And there's some of you that are sitting down. There's some of you with relationship stuff. I'm not asking you to stand up and be embarrassed. But actually, I want you to realize that it is affecting your ability to commit yourself to relationships or jobs or the next thing. So, Father, right now, I ask that you would take care of these that are standing. You would cancel that thing that says, I'm running to the next thing. There's going to be a next thing instead of standing still and enjoying and experiencing and believing that if I commit my ways unto the Lord, that you will direct my paths. And I bless them in Jesus' name. So we have commitment phobia, choice anxiety. We have uh, fear of missing out. I have used for a long time, probably 15 years, a prayer. I, I've prayed this prayer over people. If I was in a room where people knew me, you know, if I'd been with you for a year, some of you would have had me pray that over you because I, I can't help myself. And, and the prayer is based on, on Jesus. When Jesus came into town and the blind man says, Son of David, don't pass me by. And my prayer has been this, answer the don't pass me by prayer of their lives. Answer that prayer. You see, what happened in that was there's the blind man. He hears that Jesus is coming into town. Son of David, don't pass me by. And Jesus says, bring him to me. And then Jesus asked the question, what can I do for you? I'm pretty sure Jesus knew. He wanted the person to say, this is my don't pass me by prayer. You see, the fear of missing out is answered by the son of David. It's answered by him. He won't pass you by. He'll call you over. He wants to know. And some of you, it's almost about taking the risk of saying, oh, this is what I want you to do for me. Would you do this for me? I'd like to see. It's the fear of missing out. And it, it causes us to, to live lives, to not live lies, not, to not be authentic, to not be real. And actually, I believe that one of the most powerful things that we can be today is to be real, to be authentic, to be believable believers. It's one of the most powerful things that we can be. But if that fear of missing out has been getting you, you've, you've just got that nagging thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss out. Other people are having more fun, living a better life than me. I want to invite you to stand. If that's a challenge for you right now. And I want you to imagine that you can hear the sound of Jesus coming into town. You can hear the commotion. You can hear the, the bustle of, of people that Jesus is in town. And you begin to dare to say from the depth of your spirit, Son of David, don't pass me by. I can take you to the car park. I could take you to where I parked my car. One Monday morning, outside Feltham Young Offender Institution. And I was going into work. And I was, I was just having one of those bad days. I, prison governors tend to, in the early years, earn less than prison officers because they're doing loads of overtime. I, I was working hard, and it seemed like everybody on staff was going somewhere more exciting than me from their holidays. Because they seem to be flying all over the place. Well, guess what I do now? I fly all over the world. He doesn't, he doesn't, you, you don't miss out with him. There's no fear of missing out. Don't pass me by. Father, I'm asking right now that you would answer the don't pass me by prayers of everyone that's standing. That you would release faith. And I challenge you. You've heard the bustle of Jesus coming into town. You've begun to say from your spirit, don't pass me by. Get ready to tell him. What can I do for you? What's your answer to that question? Do you know what it is? Is it clear? Because he's, he's ready to step in. I, I can't guarantee it will happen overnight. I couldn't tell you all the details of what it would look like. But I know he's faithful. 
I know that in 1987 I stood in Spring Harvest Big Top in Minehead with Luis Palau preaching on a Good Friday morning, taking communion. I was working in Maidstone Prison. I was doing what he told me to do, get some experience working with people. And I said to God, when will I get to do the stuff? And he said, you'll do it one day when you have a story to tell. In 2009, my wife and I were invited to South Africa to preach in a tent meeting. It wasn't 5,000, but it was about 900. And it was Good Friday. And I got to stand on the straw bale and step up onto a rough old stage and in a tent preach the gospel and do what I dreamed of doing. He doesn't pass you by. He won't pass you by. Get Get those words on your lips. And Father, I pray, cancel that fear of missing out in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And finally, loss of purpose. Many of you will know where I will go. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I have plans for you, says the Lord. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Not for calamity, but for welfare and for hope and for a future. It's his nature. He has a plan for you and a purpose for you. And if you're struggling with that right now, and even if you didn't realize it, but you have low-grade anxiety or depression is not far from the back of your neck, I want you to stand up because you might not realize it, but your answer is to find your purpose. The answer to your anxiety, your an- the answer to that depression, the, the answer to self-hatred and self-harm is purpose. The simple discovery of purpose. Peter said this. Remember, Peter ran away from Jesus. Peter denied Jesus. But Peter would write in his second letter, make all the more certain of God calling and choosing you. It's the answer to self-doubt, to self-regret, to self-hatred is to know he has a purpose for you. Father, I ask right now that you would make Jeremiah 29, 11 like you don't have to tattoo it, but it's like a tattoo on your body that is with you everywhere you go that you know that he has a purpose for you. I ask you to cancel self-hatred, even suicidal thoughts and you would replace them with the awareness for I know the plans I have for you says the Lord plans to give you a purpose and a hope in Jesus name let's have everyone stand up and I just want to close with this I want to close with the last verse of Zechariah and it's the interpretation of the uh, it's the second interpretation of the um of the image that's presented and the answer that the angel gives is this these are the sons of fresh oil it says these are the anointed ones they're standing by the lord of the whole earth and the answer from the angel is these are the anointed ones and it means the sons of fresh oil i believe the lord's pouring out fresh oil i believe we're waking up to the needs of the world and the power of jesus christ i believe we're recognizing that we live in a world that says lies you can do what you like go where you like say what you like believe what you like i believe we stand on the great foundation that is europe our christian heritage i believe that god is going to put the plumb line back Back in our hands, the plumb line of truth, relationship, assignment, and power. I believe that the Lord of the whole earth is standing by and he wants to commission you to send you out the sons and daughters of fresh oil. So pour it out, God, I pray. Pour out the fresh oil on all of us, on sons and daughters, on mums and dads, on the old and the young, on men and women. Pour it out, pour it out, pour it out. And may we, every one of us, know. That we are the sent ones. And by the time we get to work tomorrow morning, we know we got sent. We're not second class because we're police officers or nurses or or doctors or clean rooms. We are first class ministers of the gospel of the kingdom. Pour out the oil. Pour out the oil. And send us out into a world that needs to know that Jesus is the answer for the world today above him. There's no other. Jesus is the way. Amen.